I guess so. I already am recording. I'm just gonna. It, we're just like started. I essentially like this is, came about because I don't play video games all that often, but I was playing Resident Evil Village, and at the end of it, I never watched the ending credits really. And like I'm watching it, and then I I see like script writer and your name, and I was just like, I wonder who that guy is. Like, how do you get that job? And so I look up your name, and then I realize you have this extensive background in comics, and you wrote for Marvel, you wrote Atomic Blonde, it, uh, a bunch of other stuff, and uh, and I was just like, okay, this is like what I do. I have to get this guy on and fill me in on how you got started, and then how 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 did that then transition to writing these AAA video games? Because you also wrote Dead Space as well, right? Yep. And uh, so I'm just going to stop talking. And essentially, if you are OK with it, basically just kind of I guess I'm really trying to figure out, like, wh what was like the starting point? And then how kind of did you progress a little bit further until to where you were eventually kind of writing these big IP and multiple different mediums? Because I don't really know many other people that have done what you've done <laughs> i have got a pretty sort of uniquely varied career it's true um I, I will caution that my route into all of this is not something that can be easily sort of copied yeah yeah like. of course a lot of it is just being in the right place at the right time and sort of i like to joke that i fell backwards into a lot of the things that i do these days um but I, I will tell you what happened, and that is that I started out uh, in the late 90s wanting to write comics. And okay. so I first started making web comics with um, artists who were also trying to get into the industry. You know, um, this was in the late 90s, late 90s, yeah, very mid to late 90s. And even then, you know, the web obviously was a few years old by then web comics were starting to be a thing and even at that point it was it's always been difficult to break into comics it just it just has it always has it always will be uh because it's a very very small group of people yeah who make comics you know it's a very very small community um and so i figured i've always had a kind of a bit of a diy ethos and so i figured the best way to break in would be to just make comics just make them put them up on the web because that's cheap. You don't need to pay for printing or distribution. You just put them up on a website. Anybody with a link can see it and use that as a kind of portfolio to then try and break into the industry proper. And that's exactly what I did. I did a bunch of web comics, uh, which got some attention. And at that and time then... you were just posting them like on a website or was there a platform at that time? Like Webtoon wasn't around then. So oh, no. was it just no, no, no. your own web domain? Some of them were on my website, my, were on yeah, my own domain, because I've had a website since 1996, uh, okay. continually maintained. I write it myself. I, I code it, you know, I sort of take, maintain it myself. It's been the same, essentially, website that's been revamped all over those years. Um, but also in the late 90s, web magazines, web zines were a thing. And uh, I got to know through the sort of, uh, wannabe comics creator community, if you like. I got to know a few people who were making webzines like this and feature, you know, pop culture webzines. And okay. uh, Chad Michael Ward, for example, uh, did both Reactor and Opiate.com, which were kind of dark pop culture websites. So it wasn't just comics. They also had movie reviews, animation, artwork, photography, that sort of thing. Um, and I mentioned that one specifically because... I did a um, a web series that wasn't a web comic, but it was an illustrated novel called Frightening Curves. And that was either at reactor or opiate.com. I actually can't remember which, but it was one of Chad's <laughs> web zines that he did. Um, and that was a weekly thing where I would write a chapter of a story. It was a contemporary supernatural horror. Uh, I would write a chapter of a story and an artist, Arman Chowdhury, who is in L.A., commercial illustrator working in L.A., in LA uh, he's done like album covers for Snoop Dogg and things like that, you know, very accomplished artist. Uh, but he was starting out at the same, you know, at the time like I was. And he would paint, digitally paint an illustration to go with each chapter. And that actually was 
way more popular than anybody expected. It became the most popular recurring feature on the site. Huh. Um, and it drew the attention of other, you know, lots of people, including uh, an indie publisher who was just starting out and wanted to sort of independently publish co uh, graphic novels and comics and, and illustrated books and what have you. And basically said, because uh, we got about halfway through and then took a break because we'd been doing it every week for weeks and weeks. It's exhausting. And he essentially said, if you finish it, I'll print it. Uh, which was madness because you know it's a small independent press uh printing a full color illustrated novel it's absolute madness but bless him uh he did and actually the book then went on to win an independent publisher award at book expo america it won best horror the year it was published um, nice. so all of that led me to then getting comics work uh it sort of brought me to the attention of comics editors because it was you know, even though it was an illustrated novel, it was part of that community. And so it brought me to the attention of comics editors. And I then started pitching them graphic novels and comic series. And I started out doing, uh, well, a lot of work for Oni Press uh, to begin with, you know, um, mini series and graphic novels with them uh, mostly. And then I also did some work for Avatar Press, uh, a lot of work adapting prose work by Alan Moore into comics form, which is a very surreal Whoa. Very surreal thing. Uh, but yeah. one of those, for example, was uh, Fashion Beast. His screenplay, his okay. notorious screenplay from the 1980s that he co-wrote with Malcolm McLaren, which they said was unfilmable. And so we turned it into a graphic novel instead. And that became a New York Times bestseller. Um, and I, I mentioned all of this to say that, like I say, it's a very odd career path that I've had. It's not really something that could be easily replicated other than to say do what you're interested in sort of you know make things happen yourself don't rely on other people coming to you because they may not even know who you are you know yeah. do things that you're sort of interested in and passionate about and they can lead to bigger and better things and you know you can follow that progression through to eventually yes writing co-writing daredevil for marvel with andy diggle uh i wrote a wolverine graphic novel for delray manga uh i wrote the shang chi miniseries that tied in with spider island that sort of thing um so yeah you can you can kind of see the progression all through that and then how did that get into video games well i originally wasn't hired to write the video game script for dead space i was hired to write a series of tie-in comics okay um, that were being produced developed and produced at the same time as the game was being developed which at the time was very unusual. Historically, it used to be that a video game would come out and then a year or two later, if it was successful, the marketing department would decide to license uh, a, you know, a comic or toys or whatever to tie in with the game. Yeah. That's how it used to be. And honestly, a lot of the time they weren't all that good because not that much time and thought was put into them. But with Dead Space, they wanted to do something different. The developers wanted to make a comic series and an animated movie that would be released in the build-up to the game. They would be released ahead of the game. Oh, whoa. Build okay. anticipation for it. That Which did happen, unusual. right? Sorry? Didn't, that did happen. You had the comic oh, yeah. series come out before the game. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember that, the animated like say, that... film, but yeah, I remember the comic series. Yeah, yeah. No, the 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 anime came out about uh two months, I think, before the game as well. Okay, and it okay. all served to like you know build up anticipation. But like I say, that was quite innovative at the time. That sort of transmedia approach was actually quite new. Um, so I so I was involved, even though I was writing a comic, not the game. I was involved in a lot of the calls about developing the game. And I was on a lot of the email threads and all that sort of thing. And obviously I had to come up with some original stuff myself as well for the comic. Um, Warren Ellis and Rick Remender were the other two writers working on developing stuff for the game. You know, for some reason they gravitated towards hiring comics writers. Huh. Um, <laughs> so I wrote the comic uh, or I started writing the comic. And I think I just turned in issue two, the script for issue two of the comic. And, uh, I think it was Chuck, Chuck Beaver, who was the narrative director of the whole Dead Space series, approached me, or my agent at the time anyway, and said, uh, we really like what you're doing with the comic. 
we really like your approach. We really, you know, we, we think this comic's really well done. You clearly can write. And we also like your approach to the material. So how would you like to write the game or to try out for writing the game, I should say? They didn't just hire me on the spot. I had to do, a, you know, samples. And there were other writers, I believe, in the mix doing the same tryout trials. Um, but they offered it to me and I said, yes, of course, I'd love to. I'd wanted to write games for years. I grew up playing video games. I'm like of the generation that grew up playing original Space Invaders in the arcade. Wild, know? yeah. And I've wanted to write games ever since I played Loom, the Lucasfilm, LucasArts adventure game back okay. in the 90s. Um, and I love games like Silent Hill and stuff. That's why I was interested in working on Dead Space to begin with. So I said, yes, absolutely. I'd love to. So I... I did my samples, I did my tryout, and they liked it and they hired me to write the game. And of course, at the time, people don't realize it now, but Dead Space was a real risk. At the time, the survival horror genre was kind of moribund. Like it wasn't doing very well. Silent Hill had kind of fallen by the wayside. Resident Evil was on a downward curve. You know, it had started getting a bit silly and more action orientated rather than horror. And people were kind of saying, oh, survival horror is dead. But we had a passion. like, And by that, I mean everybody involved in Dead Space. That was kind of the self-selecting criteria. Everybody had a real passion for this genre. Um, and we're just... And it was very unusual for EA as well, which, again, is part of the self-selection. Like, EA at that time did not make games like Dead Space. They didn't do... R-rated games or M-rated games, whatever it would be. Yeah, you know, yeah. That wasn't the thing. They did things like, I don't know, the Simpsons tie-in games, which yeah, some yeah. of the people on Dead Space worked on, by the way. <laughs> Dead Space started out as a Skunk Works project because they wanted to do something different to all the licensed stuff they were doing. Um, wow. <laughs> so nobody knew what it would do. Nobody knew if it would be a success, if it would be popular, whether it would be... A, you know, we all believe that it would be a good game, but that's not enough. You know, you can make a great game and it can still be a commercial flop. You can make a great movie and it can still be a commercial flop. We all know this. You know, yeah. we've all seen great books, comics, movies, whatever. And we go, this is great. Why don't more people like it? Why was it a flop? It just happens. Um, and Dead Space didn't, it wasn't a huge commercial success. It sold about a million and a half copies, I think. Um, which, you know, is, is respectable, but by video game standards, that's not a huge amount. And certainly, yeah. you know, not for what it cost. Um, but the people who did play it absolutely loved it. And a lot of those people were in the industry. And so it just opened doors for me. Like as soon as Dead Space was released, I started getting offers to write more games. I mean, I worked yeah. on several more games in the Dead Space series. Dead Space Extraction, the Wii light gun shooter, for example. Dead Space uh, Mobile, the the iPhone version of the game, oh, which was an original. Yeah, that was an original story as well. That wasn't it wasn't a port of the first game. It was a, a whole separate game with a okay. different story. So I worked on a bunch of that stuff. But also, yeah, I started getting offers to write other video games as well. Um, and all because of Dead Space. And to this day, to this day, even though I have written yeah, Resident Evil Village and I worked on Shadow of Mordor and Zombie U and all these games, CSR Racing, which I think had at its peak 30 million active players uh you know that was another one that i wrote for example but now all of that aside doesn't matter because to this day dead space is the game where especially with hardcore gamers when a, people learn that i wrote that that's the game they want to talk to me about i'm it's sure yeah it's old now it's 15 years old that game and yet still that is the game that everybody wants to talk to me about because it is so beloved and i like remember I said, the, time... the trailer like when i think i was in high school whenever it came out and i remember people just talking about the the trailer for the game being like yeah. oh man like this is they finally did it like because cosmic horror or like space horror like never works aside from alien and this was like from what i remember it was like they finally someone yeah. figured it out and and uh i remember it being a huge deal and i would and i wasn't that into games but i remember like being like really into like yes like finally that was just like that was a fun time in my life anyway but yeah it's <laughs> funny that because like it when people look back it's like the their fans found them whenever they were at a time in their life where when you're in high school or 
preteen reading Harry Potter, playing certain video games, like those stay with you forever. Like the nostalgia yeah. just never Those ends. formative years, yeah. 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 Dang. Uh, so uh where are you at now i guess like are you what's what's your primary uh thing that you're doing now is it so you have an agent and i'm guessing they kind of give you op you're just like any like, like celebrity writer where they're like here would this person is wants you for this kind of thing or do you write your own stuff and then as your main thing and then take in projects as you kind of pick and choose or it's it's more the latter. I wouldn't quite go so far as celebrity writer, but <laughs> yes, I, I actually have several agents. So I have a literary agent who handles my novels, which you can see behind me, and also my graphic novel work these days. Uh, I have a uh, manager in Los Angeles who handles my screenwriting work and also um, options of uh, people who want to adapt my graphic novels, my American market graphic novels to film or TV. He handles that. Uh, and I also have a video games agent who handles basically all of my video games work outside of North America. My guy in L.A. handles my uh, North American games work. Um, it's it's an odd setup. You know, most people don't have this kind of setup. It's just kind of come about by accident. Uh, but the thing is that those people are all specialists. And that's partly why yeah. I do it. Like my literary agent is a former editor of a major publishing house. Like she knows that uh world better than the other two agents my video games agent is a video game specialist they know that world better than the other two and my guy in la he's a you know he's from hollywood he's a you know a movie and hollywood specialist and he knows that world better than the others so it is kind of it's all about finding the right people for the right market my main most of my time these days is spent writing novels just because Writing novels takes a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like of all the things I do, it is the one that takes the longest. It's the it's the sprint, you know, it's the sorry, it's the marathon, not the sprint. Uh, you know, if a comic is a sprint, then a novel is a marathon. Um, so that actually takes up most of my time, but I also do still write games and I've written games continually since Dead Space. I don't think there's been any point in my career since Dead Space, where I haven't been working on one game or another, sometimes two games at once, uh, just because of the way the industry works. So those are my two main focuses. I you gotcha. Like. Um, did the agents, did you sort of meet them out in the wild or did they email you? And then or like, were they sort of colleagues to where you knew like you could trust and work with them? Or like, did you get, multiple agents that would like contact you and you kind of had to pick and choose or did no no and i'm actually I, all of my agents i've been with for quite some time uh, i'm not one of these people who flits between agents because i like to develop long relationships you know i sort of i believe in loyalty and i, I like to have a long relationship with as long as i find the right agent you know with an agent who gets me so uh my literary agent i've been with her for 15 years now and she was recommended to me by a friend when I needed somebody to renegotiate a graphic novel contract for me. She's one of the few literary agents in the UK at the time who understood the graphic novel market because he did that as well. Uh, and so she came to, came recommended to me. And like I say, I've been with her for the past 15 years now. My manager in LA, Scott, uh, he's actually my second person out there. Um the first manager I had there was, you know, we, we just sort of, we didn't see eye to eye on a few things. Um, and so after a couple of years, I left her and looked for somebody else. And this guy, my friend Scott, uh, came recommended to me again by, uh, by a friend, by a guy I knew who works in the industry in LA. Um, and we had a meeting, we hit it off. And again, I've been with him now for, it's got to be about getting on for 13, 12, 13 years. Uh, and then my video games agent actually worked for my previous video games agent. <laughs> but then they shut down <laughs> and he went off and formed a company. They shut down and just stopped being an agency altogether. So he uh, went off and formed, you know, his own agency, picking nice. up where they left off. And came to me and said, would you, you know, I'm, I'm setting this up. Um, would you be willing to let me represent you? 
And I said, yeah, because so I knew him from my previous agency. So yeah, a lot of my, you can see all these relationships go back, you know, a decade or more. Um, once you find an agent who is right for you, somebody who believes in you, that's so important. They've got yeah, to believe in them. you. They've got to believe in the work that you do and shares your your goals and your belief and your attitude towards the industry you're working in. Hang on to them. You know, once you find that person, as long as they don't screw you over, you know, assuming that you're all you're all completely aligned, then yeah, absolutely hang on to that person. That's what I've done. Yeah, and don't hop just because no some guy says they can get you something, uh, you know, unbelievable. But I, I want to ask a, a little bit of like just curiosity questions about the actual kind of writing process. In the example of like Resident Evil Village, how much of that was the stuff that you created versus like what did they like the narrative director, the other writers give you that you then work with? Like, did you create the characters of that game? Like the Lady Demistru, however you say her name. Risk. Uh, and like, did you write that character or like invent her or did someone come up with that? And did you know that like she was going to be like the main thing that everybody like cared about? Or was she just sort of like just one of the bosses that was just, I, I guess, <laughs> fill me in on like what the actual writing of the process of the game. What's that like? Well, none of us knew that Lady D would become the phenomenon that she that she has. No, I mean, again, we couldn't possibly predict that. Um, <laughs> so. Every video game is different. Every project is different. Even within stu every publisher is different. Every studio is different. And even within studios, every project within a studio is different. Uh, so one of the things you learn very quickly writing video games is that you have to be adaptable because no two gigs are the same. In the case of Resident Evil Village, uh, Obviously, I was working, there was a slight language barrier because I was working with a Japanese developer, but I had worked with Japanese developers before on video games. So I had, you know, and I've been to Japan, so I, I had that experience to to help me along. I didn't invent Lady D and the, the other villains from whole cloth. Visually, certainly, they were more or less complete, not quite, but more or less complete um, by the time I was brought on board the project. Um, and, you know, everybody knew they would be the villains, uh, but their names were up for grabs and their personalities had not been decided, had not been, uh, you know, sort of determined. And so a lot of what I did was take those visuals and knowing where they would be in the story as well, what their role would be, you know, in the overall story of the game. Although even that changed a lot <laughs> during development. The very first thing I did was fly out to Japan and spend a week in a writer's room with the game director, the cinematics director, and the animation director, um, and the Japanese, my, my sort of Japanese counterpart in terms of writing and story. Uh, and we just all hammered out the story of the game. Uh, and we came away like from just that. like in a room. You just were yeah. like slam, literally slam, a writer's room back and yeah. forth. Yeah. Wild. OK. But it, How long does although, it take to develop like a game? Well, like that's that? the thing. You okay. see, we spent a week in that room. And at the end of that week, we came out of it going, yes, we have got this story. We know exactly what it is. Everything decided and sorted. Uh, and then everything changed over the next six months. <laughs> <laughs> We thought we decided it, and actually we had not. Uh, pride goeth before a fall. Um, but during that week, it was really invaluable because we got to know one another. We kicked around lots and lots of ideas for the story, and we kicked around ideas for the villains as well. And so when I came to actually then write the villains and write the script, that was really valuable because they and develop their characters because then I, I knew what the other members of the team what the other leads on the game were looking for you know i knew I, I had a fairly good idea what they would or wouldn't like um and i also knew where they were willing to give me leeway and where they were you know sort of would rely on me to make a decision about how a character should behave or how they should speak uh you know, a lot of lady dimitrescu's personality for example the sort of acerbic i'm surrounded by fools personality that she has was that was my decision and that was something i pushed for quite a lot because i thought it really suited her and for a character who looked the way she did it would be a, an unusual approach a unique approach uh and something that i thought players would resonate uh, would resonate with players and and it did 
Um, so then I came home and we did the rest of it remotely, uh, you know, having calls like this, video calls and what have you every so often. And uh, I would write scenes as they came to me. As I say, the story of the game and the progression of the game actually changed a lot <laughs> over the next 18 months while I was working on it. But basically they would say, OK, so the next scene is Ethan does this, goes here and this happens. Now we need a script. Whoa, um, that's yeah. so wild. Like to, uh, It makes sense that it would work that way, but it's just like crazy for them to be like, I don't know what to do. Give it to the writer. And then they're like, yeah, well, oh, but, OK, now we go. <laughs> like, but a lot these... of games don't work that way. I mean, that's actually, you know, that, that's, as I say, it was a collaborative process. They would come up with ideas, they'd kick them around, then they'd decide on, OK, this is going to be the scene. Sometimes they would do previs. Uh, there are videos, I can't show you them, but there are videos out there uh, somewhere in the Capcom vaults of the game director and animation director and other people in a basement of the Capcom building with, you know, bits of foam and stuff acting out. <laughs> <Cut scenes. Whoa. laughs> oh man, that uh, sounds like such a fun job. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like that sounds like the best. And I, I'd get these really janky videos and they go, this is the sort of thing we think for this scene. Can you write a script that, you know, fits <laughs> They're these, like literally uh, these acting ideas? Out like, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I, so, yeah, I have like five minutes left. If I have, oh. if we have the, the time, there was one thing I wanted to kind of get some insight on, which was, cool. I know you've actually probably, since you're in all these worlds, there's a lot you can elaborate on. But was there anything in the process of making the graphic novel that ultimately became the movie Atomic Blonde that you can fill us in on like, what was, how long did it take for that to get like basically from a released to then turning into a movie? And what was like kind of the, ups and downs of that happening and how much do you do, like were you involved in that process so to speak like did they allow you to be a producer on the film or anything like that and, and was that hard to do did you kind of have to fight for your rights or any of that kind of stuff if you have, uh, if you can fill me in on any of that okay so i'll try and be brief so the graphic novel was published in 2012 the film came out in 2017 so that's five years that's it was not optioned it, well, it was optioned by Charlize's production company about a month before it was published. We'd been in negotiations with them for a while up oh, until that point. Okay. And so it took five years of development. For, well, five years from there, you know, right through to release. Now, to me, that felt like a long time. But I am I am I've since learned and I was told at the time by people in Hollywood. No, no, no. That's really quick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that that was a bit unusual. I was a co-producer on the film. Um, nice. I wasn't day to day it's not like i was you know sort of constantly making decisions or anything like that but i got to you know i read the first draft of the screenplay and i gave notes on it i saw a rough cut of the film and gave notes on it i went out to the set uh you know and sort of watched it being made and and that sort of thing so you know i was involved but i wasn't massively involved and i didn't want to be because i wanted the professional filmmakers to do their thing um you know, my, my mantra throughout, and I said this to both Charlize and Dave Leach, the director, was I've already written the best graphic novel that I can. Now it's up to you to make the best movie that you can. Uh, you know, that's all I care about is make it a good movie. I don't yeah. care how faithful it is. Actually, it turns out it's quite faithful to the graphic novel in many ways, but that wasn't a requirement, if you like, that I put on them. Um, but yeah, they were great. Uh, there was no difficulty. There was no wrangling. Um, you know, I did red carpet premiere in Berlin, then another one in Los Angeles. I was at South by Southwest when it was first shown there. Uh, they were great. You know, it was everybody treated me really well. They had a lot of um, respect for the source material and for me and Sam, the artist as well. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. I, I would do it again in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> ah, man, that's awesome. And man, this has been great. And I feel like you just have like the perfect example of someone where it's just like, I just started out making web comics and then I just went to the top of my field and every single thing you can do as a writer from novels, graphic novels, screenplays. <laughs> but it's all small games. steps. Yeah, it's always. That's, that's the important thing to take from this. If anybody's watching this thinking, like, how can I just all that? It's all these small steps. 
You know, yeah. there was no there was no big leap at any point. There was never a point where I went from, oh, I've just started doing this to, oh, now I'm, you know, making lots of money and having lots of success doing this. It was all these small steps along the way. And you've got to keep the determination, the belief, the self-belief, the confidence, keep the faith all the way through those steps. Because there are hard times, you know, my career went up and down, up and down like this. Yeah. Uh, but I never gave up. I never stopped. Because, you know, if you give up, well, you can't possibly succeed. You know, you have to be in the game in order yeah. to win. Ah, oh, amazing. Well, thanks a lot for giving me your time and doing all this. Uh, uh, and I, I, I want to do it again as we go d further deep into certain other parts of, of this. But uh, for now, you have a good rest of your day and uh, take it easy. I'll be keeping track of your career and read more of the stuff you've done in the past. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Max. It's been a lot of fun. Awesome. Thank you. See ya.